Okay, uh, let me begin by summarizing the main point I'm going to make in this presentation. And that is that the formation of ALBA is a counterweight to other organizations. This is, um, is this a little bit, uh, is this producing an echo? Can you hear me well? Okay. It's a counterweight to US initiatives, uh, originally in the form of the free trade area of the Americans. Uh, and more recently, bilateral agreements based on uh, US style economics, based on neoliberal concepts, that you have two different uh, uh, visions. And we can talk about a polarization that exists at many levels. And I would argue that this polarization between two different viewpoints, between two different strategies, um, are based on concrete differences of interest that exist between the United States on the one hand and much of Latin America on the other. And this, this fundamental point that I'm making uh, is contrary to much of the writing on Venezuela, much of the writing on what's happening in Latin America today. And it's contrary to what many people think in Venezuela, both members of the opposition in Venezuela, as well as many followers of the government, the former government of Hugo Chavez, and now his successor, Nicolas Maduro. And that is that personality is more important. That is, that Chavez was an important leader because of his charisma. Or the opposition would say Chavez uh, did a lot of harm to Venezuela and to Latin America because of his aggressiveness, okay? But that it was a question of style. And the US viewpoint, which was expressed recently by Samantha Power, the US representative to the United Nations, that it's about democracy, that Venezuela is moving in an undemocratic direction. Just a few days ago, Venezuela was, um, was uh, nominated as a member of the Security Council of the United Nations by a vote of 180 votes, it's 181 votes in favor and only 11 votes in opposition. All of Latin America, there was a secret vote but all of Latin America and much of Africa uh, stated publicly that they supported um, Venezuela's membership in the Security Council. And uh, Samantha Power uh, scolded Latin America, saying that Venezuela doesn't qualify because it's an undemocratic nation. I would argue that it's not about democracy. It's not about style, and it's not about charisma. It's about concrete issues that I'd like to discuss today. But to begin with, the polarization that includes a confrontation, both in Venezuela between the opposition and the pro-Chavez forces, and the polarization at the international level between the United States and Venezuela. And a lot of people don't know that at first, that polarization, that confrontation between Venezuela, between Hugo Chavez and the United States, um, did not characterize the relations between Venezuela and the United States in the first several years of Chavez's government. Chavez was elected in 1998. You may know that the president of the United States during those years was, was Clinton. Uh, Chavez ruled for his first two years, uh, which were Clinton's last two years as president. And even though there were very important differences between the two countries, there were also cordial relations. A lot of people don't know that it, Chavez had a uh, cordial uh, discourse uh, towards the United States. That, that it, in the first couple of years of Chavez's government, um, uh, he, uh, his, his, the aggressiveness that he was known for later on uh, was not part of that discourse. And that really the first incident in which there was a 
an indication of confrontation was in October of 2001 with the bombing of Afghanistan when Chavez indicated in fairly polite terms that the United States was a sovereign nation but that he was opposed to the bombing of villages that involved the, the killing of innocent people, specifically old people, women, children, etc. Immediately, the United States withdrew its um, ambassador, uh, implemented sanctions against Venezuela, and shortly after that, the Secretary of State, Colin Powell, uh, indicated that Chavez really didn't know what democracy was all about. I would argue that it's not a question of democracy. That's a question of concrete interests, concrete socio-economic interests, and concrete geopolitical interests. Specifically, it, it Chavez's is a statement from the very beginning of his government that he supported what he called a multipolar world. This became a slogan, this became a goal, this became a banner of the Chavez government from the very outset. What does a multipolar world mean? A multipolar world, and, and people here in South Africa know this as well as Venezuelans do, it means a world organized in blocks. It, the African Union, that was created in 2001, it was initiated, it was launched here in South Africa, represent, represents one block. OPEC represents another block. The organizations that the ambassador mentioned in his presentation, uh, Salak, UNASUR, and of course ALBA, those are other blocks. And so Chavez's thesis was that a world of blocks, a multipolar world, was an antidote or a corrective to a world based on the hegemony of one nation. You could use the word imperialism, but Chavez didn't. But obviously he was referring to US domination. And so this was the first issue that brought about this confrontation between the United States and Venezuela. Two different visions, two different concepts. But there were also economic issues. In the 1990s, Venezuela was governed by uh, parties and presidents who supported neoliberal policies. In fact, the Venezuelan people voted against neoliberalism. Neoliberalism means uh, that the state does not intervene in the economy, that everything is left to the private sector, the law of supply and demand. Uh, on three occasions, Venezuelans voted against the concept of neoliberalism. The first time in 98, the second time in 93, and then with Chavez in 98. But in those first two incidences, the president reached power and then established neoliberal policies. They had a complete turnabout. Um, but the most important thing that I want to point out is that during that period of the 1990s, because of this idea that the market is supreme, the Venezuelan economy got transformed. And sector after sector of the Venezuelan economy was taken over by multinational interests. The privatization that was implemented in Venezuela, the telecommunications, for instance, was bought out eventually by Verizon, big US, one of the big US uh, telephone carriers. Um, the airlines was bought out by the Spanish uh, Iberian, uh, the steel company was bought out by a multinational consortium. Um, banks were bought out by Spanish banks. Uh, the chocolate company, now this is private, this was a privatization, but it was a company that was established by European immigrants in the 40s, it was bought out by Nestle. Cement, which was also private but Venezuelan, was bought out eventually by Cemex in Mexico. So the Venezuelan economy, and the most important sector of the world, oil, oil was being privatized just like in Mexico, it's being privatized gradually. It wasn't feasible politically to privatize oil overnight, and so it was being done gradually uh, through a policy known as the oil opening in the 1990s. So that this became an issue, and it continues to be an issue. The United States supports a model 
based on the private sector. Naturally, that uh, coincides with its interests, multinational companies taking over companies in third world countries. But a, the privatization in such a massive way, and as a matter of fact, unlike other Latin American countries, where privatization meant that the private sector of Mexico, the private sector of Brazil, the private sector of Chile and Argentina bought out some of these state companies. In the case of Venezuela, they were all bought out by multinational corporations. So that this was an important issue that explained the confrontation between the United States and Venezuela. You know, the first big manifestation of that confrontation came in September of 2006. Some of you might remember or might have heard that Chavez, in an address to the General Assembly of the United Nations, um, stated uh, that the devil had spoken the day before. That devil was George W. Bush. Uh, that was met with widespread applause, but it was also, uh, it also signaled the beginning of a uh, of, of very tense relations, and not only between Bush, who was a member of the Republican Party, and Chavez, but also the Democratic Party as well. So it was by um, uh, partisan in the case of the United States. And the relations between Venezuela and the United States has suffered ever since, or has been affected by this kind of confrontation. But I would argue that that speech was really not what set it off. I would argue that it was this concrete uh, 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 economic issues and political issues that involved the interests of the United States and the slogan of national sovereignty, which has become a key slogan of ALBA and the other organizations that the ambassador referred to. Uh, five point three. Okay, that's a good compromise. Um, okay, so just to to move along to the present. I would argue, and this has to do with the word complexities, uh, which is the title of this conference, I would argue that simple situations, black and white situations, um, which has characterized the confrontation between the opposition and the Venezuelan government. These simple situations, in my mind, black and white situations, lead into more complex development. In 2002, there was an attempted overthrow of Chavez, then there was a general strike, both led by the private sector. This year, beginning in February, there was widespread violence uh, against uh, Maduro um, in order to overthrow the government of Maduro. In my mind, that was black and white. If the opposition wanted to get rid of Maduro, why not do it by electoral means? But there was a combination of violence and peaceful protests. And the media and the opposition in its discourse conflated the two. In other words, led people to believe that the police and uh, army reaction to the violent protests were, was the reaction to the peaceful protests. The two got confused. But even the peaceful protests would not have been tolerated any place in the world. Certainly not, I don't think here in South Africa, certainly not in the United States. Because there were peaceful protests, but they also involved civil disobedience. They blocked traffic. All of them, all these protests, in the first, from February to about April of this year, the students who were protesting peacefully, they were peaceful protests, but they were blocking traffic. They were creating humongous traffic jams, worse than the ones that we met coming here. Uh, uh, a few uh, minutes ago. Um, they were, it took us about half an hour to get here. Those traffic jams involved hours. And in no place in the world would had that have been tolerated. So that much of the corporate media, much of the private media, confused you know, uh, the peaceful protests with the violent protests and made it seem as if the government was clamping down on peaceful protests uh, and that there was widespread repression. But I would argue, and this will sum it up, that this, in my mind, black and white situation has led into a more complex situation. And the more complex situation is a situation of scarcity, a situation of inflation, a situation of contraband that has a lot to do with the fact that the private sector in Venezuela, 
uh, organized in an organization called Fendi Congress, the Chamber of Commerce of Venezuela, tried to overthrow Chavez on several occasions. The president of Venezuela, when Chavez was overthrown in 2002, was the president of Fendi Commerce. During the, the general strike, this general strike was really a lockout. It was led by the next president of Fendi Commerce. So the Venezuelan government reacted by promoting those companies that didn't support Fendi Commerce, trying to promote kind of like an emerging bourgeoisie. That was necessary, given the fact that the traditional bourgeoisie was out to overthrow the government. But that resulted, and has resulted, in uh, situations which are not always transparent. But that was conducive to a situation that I would call an ambiguous situation between the government and the private sector. So that, just to sum up, we have a simple black and white situation of an opposition that is really an insurgent opposition, at least it was in the first couple months of this year, from February to April, creating a situation much more complex. And the solution, I would argue, is not simple. The solution to the problem of scarcity, contraband, and inflation is much more complex. Um, and uh, just to broaden the scope, in order to sum up, this confrontation is not a conf confrontation just about Venezuela. It's not internal to Venezuela, or it's not just about relations between Venezuela and the United States. ALBA consists of the more radical Latin American governments, Bolivia, Ecuador, uh, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cuba, and the project that they are promoting of solidarity, which is what ALBA is based on, relations of solidarity, are diametrically opposed to relations of competition, which the US model is based on. So I would argue that we have a polarized world and that the proposition of Hugo Chavez of a multipolar world um, is really what's at play now. And this explains, in great part, the tense relations that exist between the United States and Venezuela. Thank you.